thing about the show is, uh, as the scripts arrive, each time I, I go, oh my god, shit, is that true? And then, then somebody dies, and somebody lives, and some weird thing happens, and it continually surprises you. That's what's good about the storytelling, but of course, that's what's terrible about doing publicity for it. Um, so I am carrying, I'm running away from uh, a situation I got myself in in Washington where um, my daughter died, and uh, I kind of fell apart. And uh, so I call Anne who uh, used to be my student and protege, and uh, she's now running the Jerusalem Bureau, and uh, she calls me out so I can get away from it all. And I am haunted by, driven by, trying to escape the ghost of my daughter, and that uh, drives a lot of the plot. Is that enough? Is that, is that vague and yet specific enough? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, good luck picking the bones out of these answers, I'll tell you. Well, it seems like Sorry. he embraces kind of a uh, new life when he goes to Jerusalem, he kind of gets romantically entangled all over again, and he's moving on fairly quickly from the grief he's suffering. That is, unfortunately, I've just met you, and I don't want to contradict you, but probably wrong about about 180 degrees. He uh, he's stuck. He's kind of paralysed, actually, um, and and weighed down by these things that happen to him. And he has this odd relationship with Anne, which is not romantic at all. I was thinking of the mysterious woman. Oh, the mysterious woman. Well, he's he's ready for, looking for, maybe, uh, or or actually more sideswiped by being snapped out of his uh, kind of paralysis, uh, or snapped out of the um, place he's got himself into by uh, somebody mysterious who who doesn't know about his past, and uh, and and that lights it kind of lights a um, like a pilot light in him that went out, and you would, th wow, lucky this isn't live TV. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, he's not looking to uh, rebuild or start his life. Actually, he finds it hard to move on, and he hasn't... You'll, I guess you'll... Have you seen the pilot? No. Just the pilot? Okay, well, so he hasn't unpacked his bags. He's been there for six months. And uh, so this is not a guy ready to start a new life. He's not a guy ready to engage with life. Uh, and life just grabs him by the balls and drags him into it. How cold was the water in that cave scene with the red-haired woman? Um, well, uh, I got dressed to go home and found my nipples had poked holes in my uh, rather thick Carhartt jacket. Yeah, it was it was freezing, freezing cold. But you know, that's one of the great skills as an actor. You have to be uh, in. I mean, I've done it a couple of times. I had to dive into the North Sea off, uh, off Scotland and save a body, and all I was trying to do was not die. And uh, similarly, this was a beautiful romantic scene in which we both thought that we would have to lose our fingers and toes when it was over. Um, but what was nice is we'd only just met, but we cuddled each other all night long to try and stay warm in the water because it was freezing. Yeah. Oh. How would you oh, describe oh, that relationship shit. that is between um, Peter and Anne? Is that a former... Uh, the thing, it, it's very interesting, and, and there's so much to talk about for us when we were doing it, and uh, hopefully people at home, because it's a... Is it romantic? They're having sex, um, but it's not exactly romantic, but you can't, uh, I'm not sure that they pull off the trick of just being um, fuck buddies was in the original script. I'm not sure that USA will be broadcasting that version. Um, they're, you know, they're kind of grabbing each other. Um, you know, they're two slightly broken lost souls who grab at each other, but not in a romantic way, but it's impossible for the feelings not to grow. Uh, much as they both try hard, and it gets them into trouble. You know, it becomes more, much more complicated than they imagined it would. They imagine they can have, um, what's it called? No strings, sex. You know. Friends with benefits. Friends with benefits, and uh, it doesn't quite work out like that. It becomes much more uh, complicated. Well, there are multiple storylines going on all over the world that kind of converge together. How much is Peter aware of what's going on, and how long? And what's his well, that's the delicate it? dance that uh, it, it's so great to have Tim and Gideon yeah, as the kind of puppet masters, because. Uh, a lot of the joy and uh, frustration and pleasure of this uh, uh, is that kind of thing when you, you do a puppet show for children and the children are going, behind you, behind you. There's the stuff going on the audience knows about that I don't know about. And I'm trying to make my way through these strange, confusing, mysterious clues. And the audience think they're ahead of me at some points and I'm ahead of them at some points. And it's, uh, that's, you know, it's like teasing in a big game fish. Uh, um, He's aware and has an instinct that something is going on that's a lot bigger than what seems to be happening on the ground, but it's very hard for him to persuade anyone else because there's no solid evidence. He's just got a sense from the way people are behaving and, and the mysterious clues he picks up on, uh, and his own background and his particular instincts, that there's, uh, there's something really dangerous and really sinister happening. But at some points that makes him look like a lunatic and uh, gets him... Um, you know, he seems like a kind of ranting conspiracy theorist. Um, uh, but then, uh, for me as a reader, like the audience, 
Uh, at some points, I'm also wondering how serious these other people and how will the strands interact is part of the joy of watching this. Can you talk about how Peter gets along with Ori's character? Well, he, uh, you know, he's an irritating, annoying, loud, obnoxious Israeli detective who gives me no respect. I'm you know, a high-ranking FBI official, and uh, he could give a shit. And um, and he smokes in the car, and he drives like an idiot, and, uh, <laughs> and at every stage it, it seems like he's trying to... Um, sabotage whatever's going on. He also thinks I'm a lunatic, you know, uh, detectives, when they say, detectives I've met, you know, if you, if you arrive at the scene and there's a guy standing with a knife, he probably killed the person, uh, you know, and it's almost always the husband or whatever, and, uh, and I just don't think anything is as it seems, and we gradually find a grudging respect for each other, um, and, uh, and it's actually a really, it's a really beautiful, touching friendship, um, but I don't think either of them would ever either describe it as that, or, or be comfortable with that description, but it is, a, um, we end up, we finally get to a place where we kind of work together, although the, it never stops being tense. Who is his biggest ally, do you feel? Nobody. The audience. <laughs> I mean, that's the joy of watching shows about somebody uh, who's at the scene, a, a maverick, or somebody who's at the center of a, um, what seems like a, a, a a conspiracy theory is that you as the audience know that he's got to be onto something and uh, and we're all trying to pick the puzzle apart and, and, and see how the pieces come back together again with Peter. He's, he's our way into the story uh, and at various different points people believe some things and sometimes they believe all of it for a moment um, but he's up against some pretty formidable enemies and some people who have uh, been rehearsing for what they were going to do for thousands of years and uh, he's, he's new at the party. You talked about working with producers like Tim Crane and Gideon Ralph. It's pretty amazing, but uh, mostly because I had to get over being a fanboy when I started. I'm a fanboy of heroes. I mean, really, I'm, I'm, I love TV. I love good TV, and uh, I was addicted to heroes and, and many of the other things that Tim's done. And he had an extraordinary project online recently, which I, I love. Um, and Gideon, I watched the original Prisoners of War. Anybody who, who loves Homeland, um, like me, could do themselves, should do themselves a favour and go back and watch the original Prisoners of War, Khatifim, because it's extraordinary. And uh, he has such an ease with story. Both of them have such confidence with their storytelling ability that they're, that um, unlike more insecure people, they're completely inclusive. So all of us get to have these discussions about, about you know, what is this jigsaw and how's it coming together? And they make it very, both collaborative and they're so clearly and firmly on top of the material that it's... Uh, it's been a bit of a love fest. I mean, that's always nauseating to read when I read about how people get on with each other, but we got on fantastically well. And the other thing is, of course, we've been bumped from country to country in various different circumstances and made this very challenging shoot. And uh, at times like that, you either bond together or you split apart and we all uh, became a bit of a family. And also, they're just, there's something, I don't mean in any way to insult any of the collaborators I've worked with before, but they are just so smart. Um, there's not many people can hold together the ele all these different story elements and the tiny turns and you ask a, a question at some point you, or you're questioning something and they go, well, in episode nine when he says this, it means this. In episode four when she's wearing this bracelet, it means this. And, you, and they have the whole thing in their head all the time. And uh, that's very reassuring. Well, or had very flattering. Also, sorry, all, uh, also Gideon is funny as shit. So he has a microphone on set and uh, we're both making a TV series that hopefully the public will enjoy and enjoying uh, his stand-up routine that has gone on for six months. <laughs> well, again, your co-worker Ori had really flattering things to share about you. What would you say was fun working with him on this Nothing, situation? he's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Really, very, I mean, basically his character. Uh, no. And he uh, lets you put him babysit his kids. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, well, we all, you know, we've, like I said, we've been in all these different places and we've, uh, we've all been phoning each other going, what are we doing now? And where are we shooting? How are we going to make this work? And also we've done some very physically arduous things. Ori and I have been in some um, situations where we've gone home bruised and I couldn't, I could barely swallow for a week when he was choking me. I think we broke somebody's rib and uh, I, I've got fabulous slow-mo footage of him getting fully punched in the face when it was obviously meant to miss by two foot and so we've, uh, we've had a lot of physical experiences together in some very hot places, some very cold places and running through rock, rocks and stuff and uh, so we, you know, we're, both of us think we're ten and, uh, and we like to have fun, we're like, you know, we're, he's very macho, or he, he's very fit, very strong, he was in an uh, Argentinian um, almost circus theatre troupe that I, I used to go watch all the time and he told me that, I was 
blown away because I thought they were all professional circus people. And so we're, we're constantly trying to outdo each other. So there'll be moments when really stunt men should be doing what we're doing. Where we go, I'll do it. And I go, I'll do it. No, no, I'll do it. <laughs> and, uh, and we like it. And also he's got... He, he, the, right from the beginning, there was a sense of family on the show. We were shooting in places where Gideon grew up. So literally his family were there. And, and Ori grew, was born there and grew up there too. And uh, <clears throat> his wife and kids arrived. And my wife and kids, sadly, were a long way away. And so he allowed me to adopt them. Well, they adopted me. <laughs> and, uh, so it's often fun. That the, it's, I found it often to be true that the people with whom you have the most tension on screen are the people you get on best with. So I did Brotherhood. And my sworn enemy in Brotherhood was Kevin Chapman, um, who played Freddie Cork. And he was my closest friend on the shoot by far. And uh, that's true here at Ori. Assuming Peter survives the first season, would you be interested in doing a dig season two? You know, there's such hubris involved in making television shows where people start. I, I was doing a pilot last year. And the showrunner said to me, let's talk about season five, where we want to get to. And I said, let's talk about the next scene in the pilot show. Um, this is a great story. It's got a beginning, middle, and a hell of an end. I mean, an epic end. And uh, I'm just trying to think about how I'm not going to die when we shoot it, and uh, whether I should actually just for one step back and let the stuntman do some of the stuff I read yesterday. Uh, and I'm not thinking about that. Would, would I work with these people again? In a heartbeat. Yeah. What happened? Your board? Sorry? Heroes are born? Yeah, I mean, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, this, is not, this is not conceived of as a, um, you know, it's not CSI. The idea is not that it runs for years and years and years. They came up with a great story. If we make it well and the audience find it and they like it and they call me and go, do you want to do it again? I, yeah, we won't get to the end of the phone call here. What has been the craziest stunt you've had to do or you're going to have to do? Uh, well, the cold is, is something. Well, you know, this is set right now at maybe one of the hottest spots on the planet, one of the most controversial pieces of land, tiny piece of real estate. Uh, and you only need to open any newspaper any day now to see how much in the zeitgeist they were when they came up with this story, and how you know, art is imitating life or the other way around. Um, and so uh, we're, our show is set in the blazing heat of a Jerusalem summer. And uh, there are times when I can't actually move my lips for icicles. And so the cold is pretty tough. And then also, I'm running and jumping and falling and shooting and getting shot. And uh, there's a lot of rocks. That we're shooting in real locations often. So there were some what seemed to be very dangerous locations uh, physically, the, where there were the rocks and rock pools and tunnels. And I'm sprinting full pelt through them. And I can't really see what's going on. And, you know, when you're on some of the bigger productions, they build those things out of foam, and uh, there's no foam in the tunnels under Jerusalem. What's your character's relationship with Alison Siddle's character? Or well, that's, that's where we get into stuff that uh, I can't wait to discuss when the show's already been broadcast. <laughs> um, she appears and pulls the rug right out from under me. Um, um, you'll see in the trailer, she has bright red hair and stuff, and the, the, there is a reason why that stops me in my tracks. And, and it's a very complicated, um, not complicated, it's a very intriguing relationship. And it seems romantic, obviously I'm older than her, you may have noticed, I don't know. Uh, so that's confusing for me and, and wrong, and yet uh, forbidden fruit, and she seems to be, uh, I'm not quite sure what she wants out of me. And um, it takes a many, many twists and turns in the times that you see it on screen, and then there's a history to it. There are layers and secrets and surprises that are continually revealed. Uh, Alice and I called each other last week, it's almost speechless with some of the things that we just read. So uh, she, it, it's unfortunately, she is at the heart of the mystery. Um, She's not the red really meter. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> when, you know, she she kickstarts the whole thing, and 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 nothing is is ever what it seems. You know. Can you talk about So that? I'm sorry that's so no, I, that's good elliptical. Yeah. That's good enough for us. I'll tell you what she is, is I, I thought <laughs> I did that thing that actors do of going, Who are these people I'm about to work with? Uh -huh. okay, I saw who she I looked her up and she's obviously a very, very popular and successful and rather brilliant uh, singer songwriter <clears throat> and hadn't done a lot of acting. And I thought, Oh, I wonder what that's gonna be like acting with her. And uh, it's just irritating, frankly, that people who haven't trained and done for years can arrive on screen and just mesmerise everybody. So you can't take her eyes off her own screen. Can you talk about things like the red heifer that are being explored in this series? Yeah, I can. So I read the script, uh, first of all, and I thought, thank God there's something I can talk about. Um, <laughs> I read the script and I thought, oh, well, what a fantastic, strange weave of fantastic, uh, of um, 
of extraordinary mythology they've invented. So because I'm not uh, religious or, or particularly schooled in anything, you know, any of the religions, so I went to see them and I said, oh, I'd love to do this, it's great. Where would you get the stories from? And they went, well, well they're all true. Well, well, no, <laughs> some, but what, which bits of Jerusalem exists, obviously, but <laughs> I mean, this stuff about the cow, for instance, they went, no, the cow is the most true thing. And, uh, and then some of the other groups in this that you would think they have invented, there are some very powerful, very well-funded, very dangerous groups in the world that are looking to bring about the end of civilization, as we know. And they are working towards it every day. And many of the things you look at, see in the newspaper that seem unconnected are not connected. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. You know, you, you don't need to do much research to find out that it's true. Uh, but the red heifer I'd never heard of, and I was in a, I was shooting Rosemary's Baby in Paris in, uh, earlier this year, and uh, the taxi driver recognised me. I speak pigeon French, and he goes, "What are you shooting in French?" And I go, "I'm shooting a thing." Set in, uh, "What do you do next?" I said, "I'm doing this thing set in Jerusalem. It's a, it's you know kind of about the end of the world in a way and stuff like that." He said, "Does it have the red heifer in it?" And I thought, "Wait, this is a plant." Fuck, <laughs> uh, does he know? Uh, and it turns out that it's something that a lot of people in the world know all about the red heifer, and there is a continual search for the red heifer. And why were we shooting? A red heifer was born. And I thought, will we get to the end of the series before um, the apocalypse? Um, but apparently it wasn't completely. There was like one hair that wasn't red. But they, you know, nowadays you can, um, you know, the communication lines are, are a lot more open. And when one is born, uh, I fear for us all. But I, I, frankly, I fear for us all, having done the show, and having then researched and found out how many of these groups really exist and how much money they have and how many positions of, of authority some of the more extreme lunatics uh, are in, um, I hope there are people like Peter around as determined and as damaged and as diligent uh, who are heading them off at the past because otherwise um, it's all over. Yeah, because it's all completely different. There's, there's, from the murder mystery, it, you, it goes off. I start picking at it, and it just doesn't seem to be a simple murder mystery, and it isn't, and it seems to me that there is something much bigger and much more sinister and much more dangerous and, and global going on, and uh, so it proves to be, but it's very hard for me to find any evidence of it, it's very hard for me to persuade anyone else to believe it also. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been slightly warned off, as you know, talking about the mysterious turns uh, in the story because that's the fun for the audience. Um, also, without anyone warning me, I'm slightly nervous about uh, angering some of the groups that I know exist uh, and are sitting in elected office in this country uh, who have an agenda that, that uh, most of us would think of as insane and they think of as, uh, as dictated from uh, the heavens. You know? yeah. If you ever had an opportunity as the actor to sit down with, across the table from your character, what kind of advice would you give him about this situation? Oh, just keep your gun loaded, you know, uh, um, and uh, try to sleep with fewer people. <laughs> Wear a condom. <laughs> yeah, we were in that room, that set of the room, the hotel room. Right. And I was looking, and I was like, there's no condoms here. <laughs> I see no condoms anywhere here. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I would, uh, if I was lucky enough to uh, see the bigger picture, I'd tell him where to look, you know, but uh, the, the, one of the nice things about this, you know, traditionally detective shows, which, is, which this isn't, um, you discover all of the evidence with the protagonist. So you, with them, you find out, you know, uh, surprising things. One of the very interesting and very skilled things that Tim and Gideon have done is something different, which is the audience know a bunch of stuff that I don't know. So there's a, that tremendous tension and frustration. Of when's he going to find out? Don't look that way. Look this way. Don't trust that guy. No, no, she's being honest. And uh, and that's, you know, that's that's one of the elemental. Um, it's one of the classical elements of storytelling that you often miss in, in detective stories. Was there yeah. a particular location in Jerusalem that was really special for you to shoot in? The whole place is mind-boggling. I mean, whether you whether you do or don't believe in any kind of mo God, monotheistic or not, the place is just humming with history and the blood of the many, many, many civilizations that have sacrificed all to conquer this tiny piece of land. And our show is not even about a tiny piece of land, it's about a tiny... <coughs> I mean, a hill uh, and the Temple Mound, which I hadn't really thought or heard about uh, until we started the show. And then if you open the newspaper now, it's the tinderbox for the entire planet. And, uh, and it's right now, even as we speak now, it's smoldering. Um, so uh, all of it. But to be shooting with the, anywhere in Jerusalem, when, you know, on the roofs, when the sun comes up and the light glints off that famous golden dome, or to be in the, you know, at some point we were in a tunnel. And I said, what's this on the wall? There's kind of black stuff on the walls. And we had, you know, we had historians and, and historian, um, 
custodians with the people that make we were in places that you know you know to touch too many things sometimes with shooting and uh, he said well that's when there was the rebellion thousands of years ago and the Jews were being hunted down and, and fighting the, the Romans uh, up top they hid their women and children down here and the Romans found out they poured oil down and burnt them all alive and that's the charcoal on the wall from where they burnt it's still there so mm. it's all there to the touch it doesn't feel you don't have to use your imagination too hard to feel the, you know, the, the power of this place and uh, and that's what drives the story. That's what's driven, you know, the, this kind of bloodlust uh, or religious extremism for thousands of years. Hmm. Right. 